And often when I'm advising startups or helping other CMOs, I see that many times when people talk about the strategy, they tend to focus directly on the tactics without having done their homework, all of these points above. Um, and that's a very common mistake. And I think it's very important that you keep, you have the entire background and you do your homework before you start talking about the specifics in terms of uh, channels and messages and those kind of things. And then of course, the timeline. Uh, which is part of the tactics. When are we doing what? And also, who's doing it? Because there's a lot of things often that has to be done. So I wanted to kind of just highlight a few of these things today. Um, and the first thing I talked about doing homework is really about positioning and positioning your, your brand in the market. And not only positioning your brand in the market, but actually positioning your brand in the minds of the consumers. So I think you all have different ideas about all the different brands we interact with, with every day. And when you have your startup, people don't, they have, it's blank when they think about your brand because you're totally unknown. So you have to help them find a hook in their brain where they can hang your brand so they remember who you are. So where is this hook and what are, what are they gonna remember about you? What's your image? Um, where are you posi positioning yourself in the minds of the consumers? Um, and this is kind of, I think, the first exercise you do when you kind of have identified the problem, you started to build on your product, you then move on to the positioning and, and think about, okay, but what do we want our users to think about us? And essentially you go through three different things. It's who is it for, like in what, in what brains do we want to be sticky? What brains do we want to exist in? And it's also about what is it? What kind of category do we belong to? And then what does it offer? What are the benefits? So who, what, the what? Um, and if we start about target audience, um, I think a common mistake um, also that we did at WRAP is like, no, 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 but we're an app for everyone, right? We don't want to exclude anyone. We, anyone can use our app or anyone can use their service. And while that might be true, it's not a very easy target audience to get because if you want to reach everyone, you better pay a lot of money. It's going to be really, really expensive for you to reach everyone. Plus, you're not going to be very interesting. If you want to be someone that's good enough for everyone, no one is going to find you interesting. You need to have some kind of edge. So you need to have someone in mind, someone specific in mind. So there are different ways you can like segment your market. And one common way or traditional way of doing it is to look at the demographic. So you can say, okay, but we're targeting women 18 to 25, young women, right? But these women can be very, very different. So. More and more marketers are moving away from demographic target, uh, targeting and segmentation and look more into the behavior. So instead of looking at gender and age and where people live, they look at their behaviors, how they act, what they are looking for. So it could be like people who are very cautious about the environment. That could be a more specific target group than two random 22-year-old females in the same city. And that is the behavioral segmentation. What I like to work with is coming from the design practice where you work with personas. So instead of thinking about a group of people, you think about one person. So at RAP, we thought about, and we had Katie. Katie started to become almost like a friend of ours. It was a person we always could talk about. And we started to give her characteristics. So Katie was our core user. She was a super user. She loved to express herself with accessories. She loved spending time in the shopping mall with her friends. Um, and she spent her extra money on her, her looks, like her accessories and clothing and things like that. And Katie became um, almost like a person in the office. And it was easy for us to talk, not only in the marketing team, but also with the product team or with the development team and, and the customer support team. We could all relate to Katie. When we were thinking about copy for the apps, so like, okay, would, Katie, would this resonate with Katie? Um, and I have my background in, 
or not really my background, but my hobby is in theater and drama. And whenever I play a role, I didn't think about like men 40 to 50, and then I'm gonna play that. I thought about one specific person. Someone I had like a neighbor, a teacher, uh, someone's cousin, someone's boyfriend, and I always played exactly them. And I, and I think that is um, uh, a way of just getting closer because we're not, we're not a group of people. We're one person. So I think if you can have like one person in mind when speaking to your team, it will be easier because then you can create copy, you can create advertising, you can create a user experience that will resonate with this specific person. So try to find out who that person is for your, for your company. So the next thing I wanted to share with you is category. Um, and this is, if you read press releases, or if you go on, um, like Tech in Asia, they always have a little, you can read about all the startups, um, and they always have this little short blurb about the startups. So this is, uh, messaging app or this is a health app something like that that is the category um, and it's important that you are specific and that you choose the category otherwise journalists are gonna do it for you because uh, they need to place you on some something so so think about going into a grocery store and you want to buy the milk you always know where to go in the grocery store because the milk is always on the same shelf and you know that the butter is gonna be close to it and in the same way, we kind of organize brands in our minds. So you need to help the consumers by putting your brand on the right shelf. Because if you're gonna put the cereals next to the butter, the consumers are gonna be confused. And in the same way, when you develop your app, try to pick a category that's already there and place your brand in the exact same category. So you help the consumer remember you um, and also it helps you when they're going to evaluate you to compare to the other brands and apps in that category. So I wanted to share one example. This is an app I'm working with. They're based in Berlin. It's called Clue. It's a period tracker. So for everyone with their period in here, uh, you basically track, track your cycle. So your mood swings, when you exercise, when having sex and when you have your period, and it has a pretty advanced algorithm. So it will then get to know you and notify you um, just before your next cycle starts. And you can use it to get to know your body better. So you see like, oh, my moods, I do have pretty bad mood swings every month, or oh, when I'm exercising, I don't have as much pain, or things like that. And when Clue were launching, they were, of course, also thinking about, so what category are we in? And one of their biggest competitor called themselves a fertility tracker. And they positioned themselves as a fertility app, an app that would help couples get pregnant. So because by knowing your cycle, you also know when you're most likely to get pregnant. Um, and they said that they are a fertility app. Meaning that everyone who's not trying to get pregnant, we're not considering them. It's not an app for me because I'm not trying to get pregnant. There is also some other apps who try to do this and say, well, we are a contraception. By knowing your cycle, you know when you're not going to get pregnant. So you can use us to not get pregnant. Now, a lot of people would look at them and say, okay, this is, this is for me. But maybe some people... Um, but then you also exclude some people, right? What Clue wanted to do, they said, no, we just want to track your period. It's not about getting pregnant or not getting pregnant. It's about getting to know your body. And we want to be with the women from their like 13, 12 to 13, up until menopause. Uh, so, we, so by choosing the category, they really helped their potential users understand the use case and also understand who they were for. Um, so I think that's an example of how by choosing the right category, you really help your potential users. At RAP, that I'm going to talk a little bit more later, it was a social gifting service. You're connected to Facebook and then you could share mobile offers to different retailers with your friends over Facebook. And when starting RAP, there was no such thing as a mobile app that you connected to Facebook 
where you then could send mobile offers and gifts to your friends. So we decided to create a new category, um, and the category was social gifting. A lot of things, it was four years ago, a lot of things were social back then, social and mobile. Um, so we decided to create a new category, and that's definitely a path you can take, but it's much more expensive and often also much more complicated. So we invested almost all of our PR efforts into building the category itself. So we talked about social gifting, social gifting, social gifting, and sometimes we talked about rap. And what happens was that we created this category, so every time someone wrote about social gifting, because other people started to do similar things, rap was always mentioned in, in these articles. So we became, by creating the category and investing in it, we also make sure to create, become the category leader. When I'm advising startups now, I tell them to go for a category that's already there, because it's so much easier. It's so much easier to tell people why you are different or why you are better than to teach them something completely new. Teaching people something completely new is much more expensive. So if there is a category that kind of fits with what you do, I would rather focus on that category and then just talk about why I'm different. But, of course, you can always create your own category. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is the benefits, the third step in the positioning statement. So, when I work with a lot of like technical uh, people, people tend to, or like product people, people tend to be very focused on the technical capabilities, the exact product functions of an app, rather than thinking about the user experience. So we tend to explain for our users ex the exact product experience, so a little mushroom or flower here. But instead of talking about the technical features, try to think about what these technical features mean for your end users. So in case you don't see this picture, first there is a little tiny person, it's Super Mario, a person who's a potential customer who then consumes your or uses your product will then become an awesome person. And what defines this awesome person? If you sell to um, HR people, they might become much more better at their work. If you're in the lifestyle business, they look better. Um, if you're in a health business, they will have a healthier life. Everyone just want to have a better life somehow. So think about instead of describing the features of your product, think about what happens to this person's life and how, how will it improve. And use that when you write down your value proposition or your user benefits or your messages. Because um, I think people resonate much better um, when it comes to who you can become rather than the technical speci specifications of it. And one example is a car. So you can explain a car saying, well, uh, it has this engine, it has these four tires, and you, you know, you can start describing on how, how the car looks, or you can say, well, it takes you from A to B, and it's pretty fast. So I think like talking about the benefits rather than the technical features will help users understand who you are. So just one, um, Example, how can a go-to-market strategy look like? So as I briefly told you, rap, you could send free offers to your friends. You had to connect with Facebook, and these offers were free because the retailer sponsored them. It was a customer acquisition for the retailers, so you could give $5 or $10 to H&M, Uniqlo, Sephora, and then people, it was basically free money, like a coupon people would then go into the store and buy something, and H&M would get a new customer, um, and you would save some money. But when we were launching, we were a totally unknown brand. No one has ever heard about us. We were essentially giving away free money if they connected to Facebook, and we realized that there was a risk that this could be seen as pretty shady, uh, and people wouldn't trust it. But our objective was to establish the, a new category of social gifting and basically become the number one. And we had a goal of, within three months, we want 20,000 people to go into a store and, and redeem something. As I told you before, we had Katie. She was our user. She loved shopping with her friends and spent a large share of her disposable income on expressing herself with clothes and accessories. 
And our value proposition was that you can, you can save money and get rewarded for shopping at your favorite stores. So what was our strategy? How did we then enter the market? Well, we realized that while no one knows about us, everyone knows our retail partners. People knew about H&M, Sephora, Victoria's Secret. These were all established brands. They've invested millions and millions of dollars into their own brands. So we said, why don't we use the retailers and let them launch us, basically? Why don't we work together with the retailers? So that's what we did. We, had, we worked with their PR team, with their social team, and we had co-written press releases. For them, it was a good opportunity to be seen as a fast-growing startup and that they did something new in the digital space. And then we also did campaigns in the retailer's social media. So Sephora would promote us on their Facebook page, Victoria's Secret would send out newsletters about us. Um, and if Sephora says that this is a legitimate app, people wouldn't trust it because people trust Sephora. So by using the retailers, the established brands, we kind of borrowed their trust um, because we couldn't really afford building up our own. It's kind of expensive to build a brand. Um, so our strategy was basically to use the big partners, the big friends um, that we had um, in the market. Now, I told you about how I view this more as a long-term plan. You have the planning, you have the, the launch, but then you also need to have a plan for growth. So I wanted to share a few things also about the growth part. Um, I think the most important part is that you measure things when you work with growth. When you, you now enter the market, you want to make sure to grow, then you need to understand, but how are we growing and what are we spending on growing or are we not spending something? And when you measure things, it's very easy to measure a lot of things because there is a lot of data available today. You can measure Facebook followers or Facebook fans or Twitter followers or engagement in the app or um, reach or page views. There are a lot of different data points that you can measure. And a very common mistake is that you simply measure things that makes us look good but don't really matter. Um, so you might measure impressions, but impressions doesn't really mean anything, but it might be a good number or a high number. Sometimes you can take this number to a VC and they will be impressed, but if it's a good VC, they will question those numbers. So I think first thing first is to think about what numbers you actually measure. Um, and don't try to look good, but measure the things that will help drive your business. Um, you can grow in many different ways. Um, one of them is to grow virally and I think that's what a lot of startups want to do because it doesn't cost you any money you don't need to spend on advertising so here is a very simple viral loop you have a person signing up who then shares your app with a friend if we zoom in a little bit we see that they sign up for some reason they have a, some kind of desire to share they share it the friends see it and then get to sign up now to get it started, you need to get people into the loop in the first hand. And this is where we use retailers and PR. And you have something called branching factor, which is basically, okay, but how many people do we share to? Or how often do I share? So here is um, a little bit more detailed viral loop. And essentially what you wanna do, you have a viral factor that's a sum of, of basically number of invites that someone sends in, but also the conversion rates of those things. In invites and then you want this to go as fast as possible so if I invite Andreas I want Andreas to immediately invite someone else who can then invite someone else who can then invite someone else and if you manage to get this right you can get an exponential growth um, and then you need to work on your churn so you don't lose any people of course and just quickly how this looked for us at RAP so at RAP, you had to sign up in order to redeem a gift. We then, because we connected to Facebook, we saw all of our uh, friends' um, birthdays. And every day was, someone birthday, was someone's birthday, so there was always a desire to share, there's always a reason to share. And then people could give them gift cards instead of just saying happy birthday on Facebook. And people then received gift cards, but in order to use it, they had to sign up. So there was also a um, conversion there. And to get the loop started, we were featured by the retailers. Um, 
And this is um, a loop we had, and we actually had it physically in the office. So we printed every screenshot of this. It could be an email, the Facebook post, the, the screen in the app, etc. And we had a huge viral loop on the wall, and then we went over the data in every single step. So the data that mattered for us was the data and the conversion in every step of the loop. Um, now we had free money that we could give away, and it's a very good strategy. So if you for some reason have a lot of free cash on hand, this is a very good, to, <laughs> good way of growing your business. Um, if you don't have cash, you might have things that are also valuable. Dropbox, when they launched, they had storage um, that they made, that you got when you shared it with friends. PayPal, when they became really big, they had cash. Um, and there are other examples, I think if you use Uber, I don't know if Gojek is doing it, but they should. Um, if, you, if you share it with, if you invite a friend, you do get credit, you get one month off, etc., etc. This is so, this is working so well, so I think almost all startups who pay or have money uh, is using this strategy today. But if you don't have money, you can still use the desire to share in different ways. So people always want to be the leader. They want to be first. Or a lot of people want to be first. So if you remember uh, a new mailbox, <laughs> a new mail app uh, launched called um, Mailbox, um, and if you tweeted about them, you kind of got a bump in the queue. So a lot of people are using, well, you can get first in line if you share this with your friends. And people do that. <laughs> so it's good to know people want to be first. People want to be early adopters. They want to be seen as a um, as someone who's early. So if you if you someone if you have a line if you make it exclusive, that's also an, another way of getting it to be shared. Another reason is that people want to belong. They want to belong to a group. Um, so you probably saw on Facebook how people change their profile pictures. Um, I mean now with what happened in Paris, people change it to like the French flag or other types of flags because people want to show that they belong to a group and they stand behind a cause where everyone else is also standing behind. So this is also like a something to use if you're in marketing that people just want to belong. Um, so there is a reason like people want to share things because they are seen as a part of a group. Maybe they're part of the technology group or a cool lifestyle group and things like that. They want to share uh, and want to show what group they belong to. And then we have those people who just want to stand out, <laughs> who just want to do the opposite of everyone else. And this is also something you can use successfully in your social media marketing. And then of course we have people who just want to be a rock star, like Beyonce. So if there's anything you can do to make your users feel a little bit more like Beyonce, then you're going to win the game as well. Uh, and that's it for me. Um, I do um, wrote down a lot of these things uh, into an email course. So if you go to bit.ly slash Lisa's course, you will receive one email every uh, for 21 days. So it's a short email that you read like in the morning um, and you get some bits and pieces of what I talked about today. Uh, so that's something uh, you can do if you want. And now I want to hand it over to Andreas. Thank you. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Um, great to see all of you here today. Uh, I want to use the full time I have um, before we open up for questions to talk a little bit about um, scaling startups and, and some of the challenges that you may encounter. Um, I'll try to use some examples from, from my background at Spotify, um, from my background at RAP to sort of illustrate some of the challenges that we had and, and what we did to tackle them. So let's let's start just with um, some of the basics around Spotify since it's it's a service that's not available here. How many people know about it? Almost everyone. So yeah, it's a streaming music service. Um, wasn't technically the first streaming music service, but it's definitely the one that's kind of figured out the right product sweet spot and has has become um, by far the most successful. So the company has. But 75 million active users, um, 20 million, I think 25 million even paying subscribers. Um, catalog of 30 million songs, um, 
they paid out $3 billion to rights holders, so it's actually making an impact in the music industry, and they're live in 58 markets. Interestingly, um, being here in Jakarta, they're going to launch in Indonesia in January, or so we hear. Um, they've also flagged that there might be delays, uh, but the ambition is to launch next, next year. How many people are already using Spotify here? Yeah, there's, there are a few. Yeah, if you have like a foreign credit card, it's pretty easy to get it to work. And uh, yeah, the other, the other, the other company I'll use an example is Rap, which you've heard plenty of from me. Please, this presentation so I don't need to dive into that right now. So let's let's um, first talk a little bit about what um, what a startup is. Uh, at least in, in my view, that's the type of company that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so, like, why, why do we even have um, why do we even have a term for startups? Like, why why don't we just talk about new businesses? And the reason um, why we have a separate term for this is because startups are businesses that are specifically designed for growth, um, and this this usually means um, that you have to think about things a little bit different. So it's you know, a lot of people start companies, but if you start a restaurant, um, it's in most cases a very different type of business from starting the type of companies we're talking about here, um, because a, a, a restaurant is not designed for growth in the same way. Sure, you know, in, in a year you might open another restaurant if you're very successful, but at startups we're talking about companies that grow, you know, in at least the single digit percentages on a weekly basis uh, in the early stages. So that, that comes with a lot of challenges. Uh, one of those challenges is that you need to have, um, not necessarily a unique idea, but you need to have, you need to have a very, very special idea. Um, and the, the reason why you need to have an idea that, that's quite special is because obviously this growth creates a lot of value, uh, which means there's a lot of people looking at, at this. So kind of all, all, of the, all of the simple things tend to already be taken. Um, I guess being here, um, another option is that you look at uh, other markets where, where there already are successful companies, but who aren't targeting this market, and then kind of can do that here before they get here. A lot of people are doing that very successfully. Um, so, so in our case, um, what we did that was kind of unique and different, um, but also very challenging, was that we were trying to disrupt an established industry. So. And we were, we were, in a sense, trying to disrupt two established industries that were very, very different, but um, were both solving a, a problem for people, but in, in, in suboptimal ways in both cases. So on the one hand, we had the commercial legal music industry. Um, they were very traditional. They were full of people who didn't understand or didn't like technology. They were fighting technology, essentially. Uh, because on the other hand, we had file sharing. Um, file sharing was, and in many cases still is, kind of the dominant way for how people get access to media online. Um, Spotify was started in 2006, so almost a decade ago. At the time, people were using, people didn't really listen to music on their phones yet, at least not on a large scale. People had iPods or other MP3 players. They listened to music on their computers. Um, but people were getting their music online. But if you were to take a random person's iPod and look at the files on there, you would see that probably 98 or 99 percent of that music wasn't paid for. It was pirated. It came from the file sharing networks. It solved the problem for the users, but not in a way um, that really satisfied the music industry. So they were trying to fight this with lawyers, with lobbyists, trying to make it harder, trying to shut down file sharing networks and so forth. Um, and they were trying to provide their own commercial services um, online. And there was Apple Muse, there was iTunes, um, there were paid download services, but most people didn't want to pay for music. Most people wanted to get it for free. Uh, and we, we looked at these two um, ways to get music and figured this, w there has to be a better way to do this. There has to be um, a way to give people access to music for free, or if they want to get a better service or you know some subscription price, but but in a way um, that's better than, than not, not only legal and licensed, but also actually a much better user experience than the existing file sharing networks. Because while the catalog there is and wasn't as great, it was actually quite a complex um, way of getting to music. If you were a non-technical person, it was challenging, it was scary, you didn't know what you were getting, the, the quality was inconsistent. 
uh, you had to spend a lot of time managing your music yourself. Getting it onto your different devices was difficult. So we figured, you know, all of this should just live in the cloud. Um, and you just connect with various type of client applications and you have access to it everywhere. You don't really um, own and manage your music. You have access to it and then you can put it in playlists, you can share it with friends and so forth. In a much easier way than both the font sharing networks and the existing commercial music services. So that's that's kind of an, something to, to think about a little bit that if you're if you're a if you if you want to disrupt an established industry because you think it's not optimal, it's broken in some way, you need to figure out a way to um, to kind of address all the the sides that the existing products already solve the problem for for people in some way. So your solution needs to provide that plus something more than that. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, once once you do get something in the market, people start using it a lot. Um, I think it's it's we're in kind of a good good position right now. If we look back again to ten years ago, we had to do a lot of things ourselves. We had to buy our own servers. We had to find co-location facilities. We had to install those servers. We had to negotiate IP connectivity with people. We had to set this up in multiple locations to get closer to users, so on and so forth. So we spent a lot of time and money on this. Now, um, anyone starting a startup that's sensible will just um, find some cloud service provider that does 95% of this work for you. So you'll host it on you know something like AWS or if AWS is too far away. Closest location here is Singapore. You'll find a local provider that does the same. So how, how many here, how many people here are using some kind of cloud service for their tech backend? So th those of you who aren't, um, are you hosting your own servers or? Okay, no one, no one's doing that. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so. Um, so that's that's kind of the first first level of abstracting away all of these difficulties and getting ready to scale. The second level, I think, is there are still probably other things you're doing yourself um, that you can find off the shelf product that take care of for you. So you know things like AWS or Google Compute Cloud or Microsoft Azure. That was sort of the first level of you know cloud services for for your backend system. But there are ton of others now that you can just plug in. They'll do things like data analytics or use your behavior tracking or, you know, the, the last company that we invested in uh, is a company called TimeKit, which is based out of San Francisco. They do calendar scheduling booking as a service for you. So if you're doing any kind of sort of marketplace or, you know, on-demand service type of startup that needs to do um, any kind of scheduling or, you know, get 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 people to find a common time in a calendar you're booking an apartment or you're getting someone to come and deliver something at your house and you need to find a time those are things that all of these marketplace startups used to have to spend like one or two months on building their own system for even though that's not at all unique um, to their business um, everyone who does this builds essentially the same system they just do that themselves with their own engineers so now you can take this existing system and just plug that in through their api um, so you know, not to not to kind of sell that company too much. It's more the general principle of try to figure out what components of your system have already been productized by other startups and for other um, service providers, and see if you can use existing um, existing components, existing APIs instead of building it yourself. You'll get to market much faster, and you'll often be able to scale better because you'll have those companies, teams that are 100% dedicated to that specific component, as opposed to your engineers. So should be dedicated to your core functionality that differentiates you from the competition. Um, on the other hand, this is also a startup opportunity because if you do see things, maybe you've been through a couple of companies or maybe you're working with others or doing different types of startups, maybe you sit in a co-working space like this and you see a lot of startups that have the same problem. Whenever you see multiple engineering teams that are themselves trying to find their own solutions to the same problem, you should see now, okay, well, maybe we should just factor that component out and turn that into a separate product. So all, all of those things are startup ideas of their own. <coughs> Any questions so far? Good. Either it means it's completely clear or completely <laughs> incomprehensible. <laughs> the other challenge, maybe the biggest challenge, I think, as you grow, is uh, how, how do you scale the organization? I think 
the first step there is um, is to to recruit the right organization because uh, scaling the organization is is primarily and there there are like cultural difficulties like how do you create the good corporate culture those things um, but primarily the scaling challenge on the org side is is a management um, problem a management bandwidth problem your teams are getting bigger it's getting harder for them to communicate they need more um, management oversight so. The better people you have, um, the more self-going they will be, the more self-motivated they are, so the less management bandwidth they will demand. So I think scaling the organization starts by hiring the right organization. You know, how you do this will be different in each case. In my case, um, when I hired the tech team at Spotify, uh, I was relatively just out of college, not entirely, I had one startup before, but um, mostly I was still in touch with all the best students from like my year in school and like plus minus two years roughly. Um, so it was easy to kind of pull, you know, the top five to 10 people out of each year um, and get them to come and work for this fun startup. So, you know, this, this sort of like, you're already building the foundation for, for your ability to hire these things, you know, years before you start the company. Um, not necessarily helpful advice if you're here right now and, and already are running a company you want to hire, but then kind of think through what people did I go to school with, or what people do I know that are good? Just try to kind of work through your network and find find the absolute best people you can work with. That'll make um, that'll make all the other problems uh, much smaller. So even though you have great people, um, as the organization grows, you'll still have some challenges. So uh, from the engineering side, we started out with kind of no real methodology at all. We just kind of broke the problems down into parts and everyone kind of grabbed their part and worked on them and we tried to sync. And that worked pretty well in the beginning. Again, this was also 10 years ago, so you know things like agile development and Scrum and those kind of things weren't as well developed, as mature, as well known as they are now. Um, over time, they started to become more popular and we started to implement kind of our own homegrown version of that, uh, which was very lightweight. And then as the organization grew, we started to add kind of more and more of the Scrum methodology and became eventually pretty much by the book Scrum. And I think that worked relatively well up until a size of, you know, between like 30, 50, 100 people. Now as Spotify has kept growing, the company now has I think 1,700 people um, and six, 700 of those in the engineering team spread out over multiple offices. Uh, they've established uh, a very, very um, advanced quite complex system of managing that. If you're interested in you know, how to do it at, at that scale, there are a couple of great videos um, online. So you can just Google for like Spotify tech organization and you'll find some great videos that will detail that. Um, I think in this case, you're probably more um, at the point where you know, how, how do I manage sort of a 10 person team max? I think you know sort of scrum methodology or, or if you want something a little bit less on or something like scrum bomb type of things actually do work quite well. You don't need to do it by the book, but you can kind of pick and choose the elements out of it that makes sense for you. Um, anything else here? That's good. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, we had at RAP and some of the learnings for it that I think might be good to share. So RAP started out in Stockholm, Sweden, where we're both from, a small country in Northern Europe. And uh, we launched a product there in the fall of 2011, about half a year after starting the company. And we had, we had a, a, what we thought was a pretty good plan for how we were going to uh, expand this product globally. We wanted to launch the product in the US uh, because we thought the US was the most important market for us. We wanted to kind of test out the product in Sweden and get to a good product market fit. And then we wanted to go big in the US and capture that market and then after that, we thought we could go to the rest of the world because um, our analysis of the problem was that we were essentially building kind of retail marketing technology, retail customer acquisition technology. And um, re the retail industry in the rest of the world looks very much to what the US retailers are doing. They're very dominating. So we figured if we get them on board, if this product solves a problem for them, it's going to be easy to sell this in the rest of the world because they'll be looking to the big US retailers for inspiration. That was the plan, and that's not how it played out. Uh, because about three months or so after launching and raising a lot of venture capital and you know big announcements and so forth, 
we were cloned by Rocket Internet, that I'm sure a lot of people here are very familiar with. Um, so they launched um, their identical, like almost pixel by pixel clone of RAP. Um, they had even, you know, copied some of the spelling errors in our FAQ. So you know that lat level, <laughs> uh, and they were super aggressive. They weren't, you know, they weren't going to be just in Germany or whatever, and then maybe some other country. They were going to launch simultaneously in 30 different countries. They were hiring 150 people. They were saying that they were going to raise 50 million euro of venture funding. So we were like, okay, what do we do now? Um, we could either stick to our guns and kind of execute an original plan, with uh, with of course the risk that they would capture all of the rest of the world. Um, you know, similarly to how they have done with my city deal versus Groupon and so forth. So, so we um, we had a CEO who took this copying thing very personally, and we had a board who didn't like Rocket Internet. So, we had. You know, we had quite a lot of people who wanted to fight back hard. So that's what we did. So three months later, RAP looked like this. We had people in 18 countries working with retailers to launch this product all over the world. Um, this would not have been possible if we hadn't had a lot of help from one of our investors, which is Atomico. Atomico is the London-based venture capital firm started by Nicholas Sandstrom, who was the founder of Skype. So he, um, he has built what's not unique, but special at least about this uh, this VC firm is that have a very global mindset. They invest globally, um, not so much in, in the US, because they feel they don't really have a good edge against American venture capital lists there, but they do invest in, in all parts of the rest of the world. And they have a very good international network. It's mostly ex Skype people that they've been able to bring on board as advisors, as local you know, scouts and whatnot. So through that network, we were able to get people on board in all of these countries within less than three months. Um, so that's that's another thing. A lot of people kind of say that, no, you know, investors are just stupid. It's just money. They'll never help out. I don't think that's true. I think investors can actually be extremely helpful beyond just the money component to startups. So don't underestimate how much beyond money you can get from your investors. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, another of our investors uh, was Greylock, a uh, Silicon Valley-based venture capital fund. And at one point they told us that I don't think any other portfolio company has ever gotten so much help from us uh, because we asked for it. Most companies never do. Um, the other learning from this though is that you know, while we fought, felt we didn't have a choice, you should probably think twice before you let your strategy be driven by your competition. It's very dangerous. In our case, we were in this situation, you know, we had all of these people who were working on all these markets and we were burning through like a million and a half US dollars a month. So completely unsustainable. We almost had no revenue at this point. So after a while, um, as we had started beating the rocket clone in market after market, they started scaling back. They closed down office after office and we followed um, quite soon thereafter because we didn't really want to be in all these markets at this time. We couldn't afford it. We weren't mature enough as a company, as a product. So after some time, we shut down most of the markets outside of North America and Europe. And after some more time, we were back to only Sweden and the US, the position we would have wanted to be in the, in the beginning. But this was kind of delayed by 12 months and cost a lot of money and had to you know, push us through another funding round way too early and so on. Uh, and to sort of add insult to injury, at this point, we also started to see some um, problems with the initial product. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to what those problems were. Um, but what they led to was that RAP actually, um, about a year after that, which is about a year ago, closed down its US business as well and was back to only Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now the company is uh, just about to launch Finland. So this is where the company is now. Um, so you know, it can go back and forth. Uh, they do sell it. They do say that startups are a bit of a roller coaster ride, and this has really been one. Um, about the product, though. Um, so here's here's I think a very very important learning, um, and that is, I'm sure you've heard about. How, how many are familiar with the term product market fit? Okay, a few, a few. Uh, those of you who aren't, Google it, and and more importantly, Google something called customer development. Um, so customer development is a term uh, used by a few people, but I think the one who kind of summarizes it the best is Steve Blank. Um, so try to read a few of his texts on this. It's just a good methodology for how you kind of bring 
your product to market and, and validate that there's actually demand for this product, that people are willing to pay for it or want to use it. Um, and it's sort of a very test-driven methodology for getting to the point where you have people who really, really like this product, and that's when you can kind of turn on your growth engine, the things that Lisa talked about, and start to get this product out in front of a lot of people. But first, you need to figure out what product people want. Now, this, this is sort of a lot of people who do startups learn this, they know about this. Um, but the experience with RAMP is that it's not, not always that obvious when you have a product market fit and you can have false positives here. So uh, as Lisa mentioned, RAP grew very quickly. Uh, within you know, the first year, we had 10% of the Swedish population in our user base. It's a small country, so small absolute numbers, but still very, very big market penetration, very big market share for, for such an early stage startup. And we had you know, millions of users in the US and it, it all grew very quickly, it was super viral. Um, but this was kind of a complex product with, and, and all marketplace products tend to be. So we had several important touch points, not only with the end users, but also with our retail partners. So Wrap was worthless if we didn't have inventory, if we didn't have these offers or deals or gift cards that our users could give away and share with their friends. Wrap was useless. And if those deals weren't good enough, um, people weren't willing to share. So we were dependent not only on satisfying the end users, but also on satisfying the retail partners in the sense that this actually over time made financial sense for them because every marketing investment has to at some point. Uh, so either uh, we had really good offers and people allowed to share them and our user base grew very quickly, or as retailers started to see that, oh, it's actually kind of expensive to give away a $10 gift card and someone comes in and gets something for free and I don't know if that person comes back. Um, you know, they wanted to put restrictions on the offers and then it kind of worked out better for them financially. They could see that, yeah, this is kind of a good customer acquisition channel, but then our users weren't as interested anymore because, you know, they, they wanted to get a lot of stuff for free. So we were never able to overbridge that gap between what's good for the retailer, what's good for our users with the first product. We went through some minor iterations and then about a year ago, um, as we shut down the US office, we focused everything on like a very relatively new product, the one that we have now relaunched in Sweden. Um, so that connects RAP to a credit card and you know gets much, much deeper into that person's spending patterns and lets retailers target these offers based not just on like who that person is, you know, if it's if it's a guy or a girl or you know how old you are, where you live, but actually what sort of things do you spend your money on now as well as in the future. So if you're H and M, you can do something like, oh, uh, I want to target everyone who is spending $500 a month or whatever on fast fashion, but never come into an H&M store. That's quite an attractive group to target as a retailer. You're essentially targeting your competition. You can spend quite a lot to acquire those users, especially if you can validate that campaign by seeing in the future that, oh, they actually came back like three, four more times in the 90 days after that initial acquisition. So this is a, a much more you know, data-driven product that works, um, we think, better for everyone involved. So um, the learning here is, especially in complex products, you know, of which there are many now as everyone's building these marketplace startups, you need to you kind of need to question yourself, I think, even more when you're trying to do your customer um, discovery and, and validate your product market fit. Because if you start putting a lot of money into growth um, before you're really sure about that, you might be just burning through that cash. And then when you have your good product, which I think wrapped us. Now you might be out of money, and that's kind of the position Wrap was in. Now the company was able to raise another round during the summer, which is good, so it has kind of a second chance. Um, but you might not be as lucky. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of that on uh, learnings from Spotify and Wrap. I figured I should say just a few words about what we're up to now, uh, why we're here. Uh, we both left our operational roles at Wrap about a year ago, more than a year ago, when we shut down the US office and everything was like refocused on this new product in Stockholm. Uh, for personal reasons, we weren't ready to move back to, to Stockholm at the time. Uh, we liked being in San Francisco. So we were there for about a year more. Um, and then we started this new product project, um, which is called Approach, which is not a product. Um, it's more of a personal um, educational product project. I keep saying product. Um, so the plan with Approach is that we're going to go and live in uh, 10 different countries for six months at a time, um, so that's five years. Uh, and the countries are you know, roughly the top 10 economies on a 20 to 30 year perspective, um, with the purpose of 
learning as much as possible about those places because we think the best way to learn about a place is to actually live there, not just to read about it or talk about it or hear about it from someone else who's from there, but to actually go there, live there, live and breathe the air, talk to people, you know, eat the food, meet everyone who's doing things that are interesting. Um, and then, of course, since we do have our startup background, we want to work with startups and investors um, as well. And if we find the right companies um, that are also, you know, think that we can contribute with something, we want to do some early stage angel investing in, in these local markets. So we started this about what, two months ago. And first stop is Indonesia, super exciting place. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you, everyone. How, how are we on time? Um, ten past eight. So maybe okay. Yeah. One, one or two yeah. Questions. Do we have any questions? Yeah, I think we're, we're okay. Have a small change. Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Afi. Uh, my startup calls Do It Good. It's basically a financial planning uh, application. Uh, my question is uh, we have a subscription model for our business model, uh, just like uh, Spotify did. Uh, but I would like to ask is there any uh, specific strategy uh, for, uh, for us to launch? Uh, uh, in relation with uh, the business model, is it is it wise that we have uh, that we are going to charge uh, users uh, by the time we are launching, or is it any specific strategy? That's basically. And it's more a question for you, but I'll, I'll give one short answer first. I'll give the mic to you. Um, I think if you can afford it, I think um, you know nothing beats free. So I think if you can if you can make the product free, at least for now, um, I think you should. Here's a problem with that though, um, is that it's sort of hard to raise prices. So if people have gotten used to get something for free, they're not gonna be happy to start paying for it. Um, there are ways around that. You can do like free trials. So you can say, well, you know, the first three months are free and then we start charging so that people get to try the product and then it's easier to, assuming it does deliver value and if it doesn't, then you need to find another product anyway. But assuming it does deliver value to people, it's easier to get them to start paying after they've tried it out. The other way to do that is if you say, well, you know, the product costs whatever, $10 a month, but since you're such an early user or whatever, we like you, we're gonna give you a discount. So it's gonna be free for you. And then you kind of, you still have established your price point, but you're you know, kind of hiding the fact that you're giving it away for free. Yeah, and I was gonna say exactly that. If you look into a lot of the uh, software as a service companies, SaaS companies, that's usually the strategy they take. Um, and there's been like, quite a lot of people who've been blogging about or, or re reporting about how they, at first they had their product for free and they had a pretty bad conversion on the website and then they started to put up but um, like a, just a fake price. But then they said, but right now it's for free. And then they could just see, by, but just by setting a value to it and um, they could see that the conversion increased quite significantly. So I think it's important, if you do want to charge in the future, I think it's important to, to show that uh, because we tend to correlate price with value. Um, I mean, the more expensive a per bottle of perfume is, the better we think it is. Um, so that's kind of how we work So as, as humans. So I would, I would definitely put a price on it, but then I would say like you can get a month for free. And also if you do have a price for it, you do have a mechanism, then you have your free money essentially. Because then you can say, well, you do get a month for free, and then if you invite five friends, you get another month for free. So then you start having your viral parts as well. Um, so if you don't have the free money, you can create them by, by, by having a price on your product. Because in the mind of the consumer, it's, it's free stuff. Um, another kind of related thing that you can do to help you with price discovery, um, or, or even to test out products without sort of um, hurting the market you really care about is to find a smaller market that you can kind of launch it in first. And if you're doing apps, it's very easy to work with like regional restrictions in the app store. So it just depends very much on what you're doing. If you're, what, you're, what you're doing sounds more like it, it's quite local. It requires partnerships. So it's not, you can't just do it in another country just to try it out. Yeah. But if you're doing, for example, a game, it's different. There's usually no, no localization. So a lot of American companies, they launch their things in Canada first, because it's a less important market to them, but it's still culturally similar. 
so you, they'll get the right type of feedback. So they just try to launch your game in Canada, and, and you know, only if it gets a lot of traction, they launch in the US. If not, they kind of take it down and tweak it a little bit more, try again. <coughs> um, so they can do that without sort of hurting the market they really care about. It's one more, one more strategy. Any more questions? Run us fast. from Prosnel.com, it's about the healthcare marketplace. And what I want to ask is about the PR incentive. Because uh, you say that if you if we want to create it, a new category, and then I want to know about the, how much money you invest on that, and how many channels. Uh, about the me measurement, what measurement do you track for the PR? Because PR is about, uh, <coughs> it's so scattered. And then sometimes it, it, we go offline, uh, like printed media, and then what measurements do you track for the PR investing? Okay, yeah, thanks. It, it's a great question. Um, so the question is, um, how m if you want to establish a new category, how much do you need to invest? And also, how do you measure PR? Um, so I don't think there is an upper limit in how, you, how much you can invest. It depends. We went into the US market, um, so we invested quite a lot of money uh, to be specific, it was $50,000 per month. <laughs> we paid our PR team and then we had two people basically working full time. Uh, so two employees and $15,000 per consultant. That's what we invested in PR um, for a year. Um, but if you do, if we did PR in Sweden, I did all of my PR myself. We didn't have any PR agency. Um, so then it didn't cost very much. So it depends on what what market you're going to, and if you have if you have established relationship already yourself with the with the journalist or with the right outlets, then you don't need to spend very much. But if you go into a market where you don't know people, you need to hire people with the right media relations. Um, now the second question is interesting. It's like, but how do you measure PR? And I think one thing to remember is that PR is not a very good strategy. It's not a very good tactic for user acquisition. If you want to have a lot of users, there are a lot of different tactics that are way cheaper than PR. Typically, even if you are like front page on one of the big American tech sites or even business sites, we were like Wall Street Journal, um, TechCrunch, and Recode, and didn't exact. Ah, we were in all major publications, and we had like me two thousand users. And if we did a campaign with Sephora, we broke the service and have fifty thousand users a day. So. Having said that, PR is still a good strategy, I think, if you want to launch, especially if you want to create a new category, because PR uh, helped us get our partners on board. It helped us get employees on board. It helped us get our investors on board. So I think PR is a good tactic to use for all other stakeholders apart from users. So to, to reach like, uh, so when we did a lot of PR, we had a lot of really good talent who wanted to work for us who came to us because they read about us. We had a lot of the top C-level people at Gap. <laughs> the, the reason why we started partnering with Gap was because they came to our website and they signed, they, they write, wrote in our form, hi, I'm an interesting merchant to start working with you, slash Gap, US North America. We were like, oh, okay, we should call these people. And they had read about us in the news. Um, and also I think investors they kind of want to follow the hype, so they're like, oh, social gifting, this is a new thing. Uh, so we want to be part of the journey. So I think you can get a lot of other things, but don't expect getting a lot of users in PR. Should we do one last question? I think the mic is, okay. One last question. Hello. Do I have to stand? <laughs> uh, okay, my name is Rahma, and I'm not coming from any startup yet. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask about uh, scaling the startup. So, uh, in your company sample, uh, the scaling for the organization it's on your own company because I heard somewhere that unmanageable growth is worse or killing more than bad luck or bad management. Uh, and uh, as you give example, like Spotify, uh, but, uh, but Warp, right. it's from lot of country more into again back to one country and how do you tell that to your investors and also I want to ask your opinion about uh, about the startups or the company that actually have 
to manage partnership. So their services is actually dependent on their partner instead of themselves. And because a lot of partner and how do you scale about that? Okay, so a couple of questions. Um, let's see if I can address them all. Um, how do you tell your investors that you're not doing as well? Oh, that's, that's, not, that's never fun. Um, but <laughs> on the other hand, um, in our case, like we were supported by our investors at every step of this journey. And uh, our investors were on our board. And a lot of these like big decisions as in like, do we go after Rocket? Or do we close down all of these markets that we actually don't want to be in and is, are too expensive? They were all on board level, which means you know, we took these decisions together with the investors. Um, so, you know, they were, I'm not going to say they were equally responsible because ultimately it's up to the management of the company to make the business success. But it's not like, you know, we had to, it's not like we only met them once a year and like, oh, here, it's not going so well. It's like they, they knew and like we, we were constantly updating them. Um, then uh, if you have external dependencies uh, on partners, like how do you scale that? Uh, so, depends on your situation. I would say both Spotify and RAP are, are good examples of, of companies with very big um, partner dependencies. Um, in either case, it's good. Like if you can be independent, that's much better. But um, many type of businesses are based around partnerships. Uh, and then uh, the Spotify situation is much more problematic because uh, the way content works, the way copyright works, you have if you have copyright to some piece of content, you have a government granted monopoly on that content, which means you're the only supplier, um, which means uh, Spotify needs to strike a deal with every major and most of the minor record labels, because if it doesn't, it just doesn't have that content. It's not like, you know, let's say, no one knows what artist is on what label, but let's just say that Madonna is on Universal. And if, Universal doesn't want to strike a deal with Spotify for distribution, then there will be no Madonna on Spotify. It's not like Spotify can go to some other music label and license Madonna from them instead, because each one has a monopoly. So Spotify's problem with their partners is that they need to have all of them on board all the time. If one cancels, if it's a big one, it's a huge disruption to the service. Um, so yeah, then, then you're essentially in a situation where you're kind of constantly in negotiation with those partners and the challenge for that company and that's also what you know all people who are kind of analyzing spotify as a company point to or any any music streaming company because this is not unique this is true for all of them right um is that well you know will they ever be able to make money like if they become profitable won't the labels just increase whatever they demand out of that and like increase their share um so that the margins will always be raised then um maybe uh i think and here's, here's the interesting um, thing that you will want to try to get to if you are in that position, in that type of relationship. Um, because there's, there's like one, uh, there's a point at which, uh, you know, the, the dynamics, uh, the power dynamics of this relationship shifts. So if Spotify gets to the point where it is a large chunk out of those labels revenue, then they can't just say no, um, because they again have, investors, they have owners that they need to explain themselves to. So Universal can't just go to their owners and say, ah, you know, we just uh, we just actually turned off like 50% of our revenue uh, because we don't like Spotify. Um, so like if you become big enough, then that dynamic shifts. Now the better, the better situation with partners to be in is the one that RAP is in. So RAP, as I said, without its retail partners, it's nothing. The product is is as empty as Spotify would be without music if it doesn't have any offers from the retailers. But RAP is not dependent on any one retailer. If H&M says no, we can go to Uniqlo and get their deal instead. So that's a much better situation. So like ideally, if you are building something uh, which depends on partnerships, that's fine. Um, but try to position yourself so that you're not dependent on any one partner, so that you can pick and choose a little bit. Because then you have much more leverage in negotiations. You know, whether, whether you can actually make this choice or not depends, of course, on what product you want to build. Like Spotify can't make this choice because it's just the fact of the industry it's in. Um, rap can. W I think those were the questions. Uh, one, one more thing, actually, on partnerships and scaling. 
uh, a type of partnership I want to, to warn against, uh, which, which we engaged in a lot unsuccessfully with RAP, and that is, that is trying to work with large uh, companies as partners for distribution. So we, we engaged in partnerships that didn't lead anywhere, ultimately, with, um, at various times, Apple, Google, Facebook, PayPal, uh, and, and Silicon Valley. We spent a ton of time on these partnerships, uh, and what we didn't realize at that time, which I think is quite clear now in retrospect, is that for, for those big companies, they're just evaluating a lot of options. So and they have a lot of people, they have a lot of resources. So you know, while we were talking to, let's say, Facebook, and we were spending a lot of resources on, on you know, establishing that relationship, Facebook probably had about 20 of those discussions in parallel with other companies, and most of them never pan out, but they can afford to just, you know, they'll, they'll engage in this discussion and you know, see where it goes. Um, as a startup, you don't have that luxury. So you should always take, I think, responsibility for your own distribution. It's very dangerous as a startup to rely on a partner for distribution because often it doesn't pan out and then you have no distribution. So that's another learning. Okay, thank you everyone. Great to be here.